Sometimes his aggressiveness is a little bit of a question, but he has tended to play his best games against the best opposition, particularly against bigger opponents. And I don't mean big names in terms right. of the team. I mean taller, stronger guys. Sometimes, Physically bigger. Yeah, sometimes he has struggled in uh, Big South play where there's a lot of smaller forwards and centers. Watson to Jawan Smith to Dane Bradshaw. Now back into their 2 3 matchup zone. Lofton is on the bench, but Juwan Smith, who's in the game in place of Watson, is also an extremely dangerous three point shooter. So number two in terms of three pointers made for Tennessee with the second on the shot clock, a violation. Good defense by Winthrop. Wow, nice job by Winthrop to change up the defense coming out of the timeout. And sometimes, you know, you come out of a timeout like that, particularly a long timeout, and you don't really pay attention to how much time there is on the clock. And obviously, that's the trap that Tennessee fell into right there. Chris Gaynor to Martin, the leading scorer. Back door to Gaynor. Great pass by Martin. That ties the game at eight. Well, and that's a big help for Winthrop because Gaynor is a guy, when he goes to the basket, usually he's looking to pass the ball. Our second time. And now Winthrop goes back to the man-to-man -man defense. Wingate from Florence, South Carolina, across the lane. Rebounded by Bradshaw. Gainer. Oh, what a pass! That was a great pass, and it goes inside to Williams, who is fouled by Tennessee. One of the things that I have seen in looking at Tennessee is the fact that sometimes they have a tough time getting back in transition, and that's what happened right there. Fifteen seed Winthrop, two seed Tennessee in the midst of our second tie, and Winthrop has just captured their first lead today. Tennessee was up earlier, 6-2 to two and 8-4. to four. Big South Conference champion Winthrop and Southeastern Conference Eastern Division winner Tennessee. And this is a Winthrop team that took Gonzaga right to the wire in last year's first round game of the NCAA tournament and beat Marquette at Marquette this season. So this is a solid Winthrop club. This is Bradshaw from New Zealand. Martin is the leading scorer. Oh, we travel, and you can see it. Winthrop is a school of 6,600 students in Rock Hill, South Carolina, which is about 30-minute drive outside of Charlotte, North Carolina. A very beautiful campus. It's a campus included in the National Register of Historic Places. Greg Marshall, the head coach, but that is a very pretty campus. You drive onto the campus through nice neighborhoods, big trees, and Greg Marshall's worried about the big trees for Tennessee today. <laughs> Good point. Dean Bradshaw to C.J. Watson. Now Andre Patterson, the UCLA transfer across the lane and into Bradshaw for two. And obviously what the Tennessee strategy that we've seen early, first going inside to Wingate and now to Patterson, they're really looking to attack Bradshaw. Here's Terrell Martin, Dean Bradshaw for Tennessee, gets back defensively. Schuler. And the New Zealand Olympic player, Bradshaw. This is Craig Bradshaw. We have Dane Bradshaw, who plays for Tennessee. Flying the other way is Griff Watson, the first team all Southeastern Conference selection. And you cannot be slow getting back on defense when you're playing Tennessee. They will take the ball out of the basket after you score and come right back at you. And that really played into their hands in the Southeastern Conference regular season. It's back away by Smith and out of bounds and the shot clock at 24. One of the big problems that Tennessee was anticipating is the center who shoots the three as well as Craig Bradshaw. Bradshaw has made, that's his 32nd three-point basket that he's made this year, shoots 38% from out there. He can be a very, very difficult matchup. Top scorer Terrell Martin has checked out. Michael Jenkins has come in for Winthrop. And he's got the ball right now. Wide open three by Williams. And Williams is another one of the big guys who can shoot threes. 
Not a very high percentage, only 25% on the year, but if you leave him that wide open, he can hurt you from out there. Winthrop has their biggest lead. Williams has put in six. Winthrop has knocked in a couple three-point shots so far. Here is Smith for three. Good. <laughs> That's Tennessee's first three, and Tennessee, of course, was the number one team in the Southeastern Conference in shooting three-point shots. They set a school record for threes this year. Chris Gaynor puts in a three as we trade triples from one side of the floor to the other. As a new player is in now, Jordan Howe is a sophomore from Auburn, Alabama for Tennessee. Well, the game has assumed an up and down pace that you would think in the long run might favor Tennessee. But Chris Gaynor once again showing you he's not afraid to shoot the ball. Here's Lofton from Maysville, Kentucky. And Dane Bradshaw working on Williams. <laughs> Hall, shot clock is down to two. He's got to throw it up, and he does, and slammed in by Patterson. That was great penetration by Hall. Bradshaw had to come and help out. Patterson is the guy Bradshaw was guarding. Nobody had blocked him out. Patterson has hit three consecutive baskets. He has a game high eight for the Volunteers. Boy, Hall goes to the basket. Here comes Bradshaw, and then Bradshaw is guarding Patterson. Nobody blocks out. Patterson dunks it home. A lot of people talking about this 15-2 matchup here in Greensboro this afternoon. Out early in the UAB area. They've got a South Alabama has got to find some early success even from the three-point line and uh, just to get some confidence, I think. Yeah, they've gotten good looks. You saw Lee the time with it with a wide or law, excuse me, with an open three, just couldn't connect, but uh, still a little nerves here in the early part of the game for the Jaguars. Well, and there's nothing worse having nerves and shooting a three yes. long jump shot I mean if you're gonna you make layups inside that's one thing but if you're counting on the three to get you in it's tough Smith knocks down the first three-pointer for South Alabama Carlos Smith jr. from Atlanta Georgia seven to five Gators Boy, Smith elevated from Mobile that time that was a deep jump the Andrew Bubbles has come in since the timeout there's a steal taken away by Jason McGriff This is a South Alabama team that will play 10 guys, and John Pelfrey will substitute five for five at times. Walter Hodge picks up the personal for the Gators, his first. And another example of the bus stop mentality, this uh, South Alabama team, as you see Michael Phillips coming back onto the floor. And uh, for the first time, Stephen Coward, the junior from Pearl Springs, checks into the game. And that's 10 guys all over 13 minutes a game. I mean, that's just not garbage time for a couple of them. They're all interchangeable parts. So if you hear your play-by-play -play announcer resetting the lineups from time to time, you'll know why. <laughs> <laughs> well, every game is, is like a combination to a lot. And Don Pelfrey's got 10 guys who we can pull with, tinker with a little bit to try to find the correct combination. Joiner again running into one of those Gator roadblocks as he tries to drive it into the paint. Orion Green, son of Sidney Green, who played at UNLV, had a marvelous professional career, giving it up to Moss, and he's unable to get the perimeter jumper. Understandably, uh, Donovan was not happy with that three from Moss. In traffic, Bennett rejected by Joe Kim Noah, and Brewer is tripped by Leandro Buboltz. Buboltz, a young man from Santa Cruz, Brazil. We talk about proximity in this tournament and what location, location, location can mean. And uh, this is the uh, third closest opportunity for a team in this tournament, 71 miles away from Gainesville. The interesting thing to note, too, about Villanova playing in Philadelphia, they usually play more games in that building, but right. purposely only played three so they could make that a site and uh, just about a home game for them. Wachovia Coliseum had their biggest win of the year against uh, Connecticut when uh, the Huskies were number one in the first of two meetings between those two. Torrey and Green unable to knock it down. Noah! with a steal and a jam. Well, those are the turnovers that South Alabama can ill afford to make. They get the stop and you've got to come up with that rebound. That's an offensive foul. Demetric Bennett driving in, picks up the player control foul. Six turnovers now 
committed by the Jaguars. Watch the hustle of Noah doesn't quit on the play and then stretches out. Look like he barely jumped. He's so long around the rim. Those are the, the effort plays that Noah gives this Florida Gator team. Jeffrey Collins now along with Joyner. And Michael Phillips back on the floor. Coward and Bubolts, the five on the floor for South Alabama. Humphrey dribbling through that double team. 12 and a half minutes remaining in the opening half. Both of these teams can score in waves, so the fact that they didn't scratch from the floor until we reached about three and a half minutes deep into the game doesn't mean that it won't be a high-scoring game. Steve and I, we'll, we'll talk about uh, Noah's release point and his jump shot. <laughs> Very unorthodox. We were watching yesterday in practice, almost shoots it from his nose, right. and just you know wondering how, when a big man is playing me, how he doesn't get it blocked more often. That's something that you didn't have any problem with, G-Man, because you had a fewer jumper, but he's going to have to get in the gym, 500 jumpers a day. Phillips had that one knocked away. It'll be out of bounds to South Alabama when we come back. You know, the release point doesn't matter as much when you can jam it. He certainly can uh, reject them, too. It, uh, it might, they might see a little leg wheel going down to the end. Lofton missed it. Looked like Wingate tapped it back in. Major Wingate who leads Tennessee in field goal percentage. Winthrop thus far has done a nice job handling the Tennessee pressure, but it's not enough to just beat it across half court. I think that to beat the Volunteers, you've got to make them pay for pressing you by getting baskets. Bradshaw loses it inside. Here comes Lofton. Wingate and Kevin goes. Six nothing run for the Volunteers of Tennessee. They lead by three. They've trailed by three. This is Bradshaw over Wingate. Boy, that was a tough look, trying to shoot that ball off the dribble. Nice, nice job by Wingate to make Bradshaw dribble the ball before he shot it. Lofton works on Jenkins. And then outside to C.J. Watson with the rebound hold down by James Shuler, who is a two-time first-team All-Big South performer for Winthrop with the ball right now. On range three, game of a miss. And there is a Winthrop foul. And one of the things, this is what we're talking about. There the ball is thrown in bounds, but you notice the Volunteers are allowed to get back. Gaynor pulls the ball out, so Tennessee got the, got the advantage of pressing and not having to pay for it. On the other end, when they steal the ball, they take out and go running, and Wingate gets the dunk, and that's Tennessee basketball right there. You get the steal, and you get the ball down the court quickly into excellent scoring position. Wingate looking inside, and Stanley Asunu was down there. And well, that's one of the reasons why you'd rather have Wingate dunking the ball instead of trying to handle it in the middle and make the pass. DeAndre Adams will check in for the first time. He is a 5'8 freshman. Well, Mark picked up by Watson. Here is the freshman with it. Good back up to Gainer. Adams. Williams to Mark. Trent. Second trend one went up in this first half. Tennessee has done a nice job limiting what Win Winthrop wants to do on offense. They're putting a lot of pressure out on the perimeter, and yet they are not like, giving Winthrop anything in terms of penetration to the basket. Now, Winthrop with some pressure. Andre Patterson will check out with his eight points and five rebounds. Lofton for three. Chris well, Lofton, leading scorer, leading three-point shooter, leading free-throw shooter, has just upped the Tennessee run to 9 nothing. Man, if you're going to pressure Tennessee, you better be careful that you go find Lofton. You simply cannot give him open looks at the basket. This is a big possession, I think, for Winthrop. And we're going to get an offensive foul called on Adams driving to the basket. See, one of the things that Winthrop has to do is limit Tennessee runs, and Greg Marshall's guys are on the back end of a long one now. Tennessee has got their biggest lead in this first half in Greensboro over Winthrop. He's trying to do it all on the perimeter. It's much more difficult. John Pelfrey calls a timeout, and the home fans love it. They're 70 miles away from Gainesville, Florida. 
spacing. And nothing but nylon. We can see Tennessee is shooting 18% better than Winthrop. But also take a look at points in the paint. Plus 12 right there, and that's the reason why. And one of the reasons that they're not power points in the paint, Kevin. They're points that are created by turnovers. Bruce Pearl's guys have forced five Winthrop turnovers. They've been able to convert them into easy baskets. That 9-0 run, typical of the way Tennessee plays. Well, we talked to Bruce Pearl yesterday, and we were saying we had no idea we would be this good. We were picked, as Danny mentioned before, to be 10th in the Southeastern Conference, and fifth in their own division. Well, of course, everybody talks about Bruce Pearl and how he went into the cafeteria and stood up on a chair and told the kids to come to the games and he's made so many speeches and everything and all that doesn't build interest. What builds interest is when your team wins and the team has been winning, so you combine that with his marketing genius and Tennessee has uh, suddenly developed a huge following. Three seconds left and they throw it away. Williams picks it up for Winthrop. And DeAndre. Team-altering dunk which apparently happened when uh, Joachim Noah slammed it home. South Alabama, or excuse me, they're claiming it was Brewer's dunk, not Noah's. There were two of them, so it's Brewer's dunk. And apparently, as he hangs on the rim, the South Alabama bench noticed that they said, wait a minute, it's supposed to be 10 feet. It may not be any longer. So. That, that is a, a much more scientific object that they have that's measuring the rim. <laughs> My day, they used to have a pole that was 10 feet long with a little hook on the top, and if it touched the floor, then it was good it, to go. It's all good. That's right. So that's that's a case of the iron not unkind or kind, but leaning. <laughs> yeah, I'm not. They, they might have said it was Brewer, but Brewer 185. I'm thinking it was it was uh, Noah. It may have been Noah. Yeah, I thought it was Noah myself, but it could have been either one of the two. But apparently, uh, Timmy Higgins able to figure it out. He specializes in hieroglyphics, that Higgins guy. <laughs> he and John Hughes, Elton Steed are officials for today's game. I don't want to date Higgins, but he's been at it a long yes, time. <laughs> I, saw, I saw him plenty of times in my college career. Joyner rejected by Noah. Three so far for Joaquin. Son of Yannick Noah, of course, the tennis Hall of Famer. And keep in mind, Timmy, that uh, Joyner, their leading scorer, he's got Brewer on him, which is a long cover for him to try to shoot over and then have Noah following behind. I think it's going to be tough sledding for him in the paint. Well, you mentioned tough to manufacture shots, Steve, and I, they may have to pull up and try an in-between game here because the closer they get to the rim, the more in trouble they, they are. There's an in-between shot right there from Leandro Bubo. And that's a tough shot for a big fella like that with the touch to go off the glass leaning in. Good job that time in the mid-range game, but this is where the Jaguars have to get it done. They have to get made shots and get into their pressure. Noah and Horford can play high-low. Two outstanding front court players that can face the basket. There's a steal from the backside by Carlos Smith. Collins, that's a three too strong, taken down by Joachim Noah. And a timeout taken by the Gators. 9.52 remaining, the Gators have doubled up the Jaguars. Joachim has four blocks and five rebounds. We'll be back in, uh, in South Alabama right now. Well, Noah trying to feed that bounce pass into Horford. He was unable to retrieve it. Well, the length and the defensive backflow of the Gators really shuts down opportunities at the basket. Smith and Joyner can get past their original defenders, but these big men just don't quit on the play. Constant, constantly coming to the from the weak side to either block or alter shot. Carlos Smith picked up by Torian Green. Boo Bolts is also on the floor. Go along with Mario Joyner. McGriff, there's Boo Bolts again. Ho, ho, ho. How about the iron being ever so kind? Well, you know what? In uh, talking to Jack Huffman yesterday, he said all season somebody has stepped up for us. So well, they're struggling right now, and then maybe Boo Bolts is the guy who's going to step up. Tough pass. Humphrey able to save it. And there's a steal by Joyner. And he carried it. 
He came in. He was out of bounds. Oh, and he was he, the first player to touch it coming back in bounds. Okay, that's the call by Timmy Higgins. So he was out of bounds. Well, for many of you that were expecting the start of Alabama and Marquette, as you know, we had a bomb scare earlier in San Diego. They had to empty the building. And uh, that game is starting a bit later. So for those of you expecting to see it, we'll be getting you out there as soon as they tip it off. Humphrey for three. This is a young man coming off a bicycle injury that nearly cost him his career. He came back from that shoulder injury at 25 points in the SEC tournament game against LSU and did not look back. Played some of his best basketball there. Horford has that one knocked away. Good defensive work by Bennett. Oh, Jaguars are st still finding themselves in pretty good position. Only 4-17 from the field, 2-7 from three, so they haven't gotten on track, but we haven't seen that knockout punch from the Gators. No, not at all. As a matter of fact, uh, it's amazing when you watch the free flow of this game that they're only down by seven. They have really struggled. I, mean, they're, they're, I think the happiest people in the building are for TV timeouts of the referees. <laughs> <laughs> they would really be gassing right now if there were no stoppages of play. Out of bounds, it belongs to South Alabama. John Pelfrey against his old mentor today here in Jacksonville. Win it. Win NCAA related prizes every 35 seconds at MikeCopeRewards.com slash NCAA. With Dan Bonner, Kevin Harlan. Just under four minutes to play in the first half. Tennessee it, leads by five, and they've led by as many as six. And it has been a very entertaining first half. Tennessee has been able to get the game going in a transition pace, a pace with which they're very comfortable. They've done a nice job shooting the ball from the perimeter, have made a couple of threes, have forced some Winthrop turnovers. It has been a very well-played game thus far. Winthrop dropped back into that 2-3 zone. Andre Patterson back in the game for Tennessee. Fighting for it inside, they can't get it. And here comes Chris Gaynor. Tennessee in the man-to-man. -man. And thus far, the Volunteers have done a real good job keeping Terrell Martin away from the three-point opportunity. Martin for three. Oh, he got it. Just as it comes out of your mouth, <laughs> just as quickly does it leave his fingertips. <laughs> and Bruce Pearl, he is uh, wondering how in the world that happened. But Martin has done a nice job staying active. He has scored points on the inside, but he's just gonna come off the screen. A nice screen by number 33, Williams. This is based on ball movement. Martin, you mentioned the leading scorer for Winthrop. He gets his shot off very, very quickly. This is a guy who had 22 against Gonzaga last year, made six threes. C.J. Watson will take it. Children. Greg Cox Arena the same 12,000 fans uh, delayed by some two hours in their arrival although they were outside Alabama's Crimson Tide from the Southeastern Conference and the Big East Marquette Golden Eagles they are in the Oakland bracket and they're the team's uh, couple of wins will earn the chance to go up and continue their quest for a national title on the east side of the bay. Dick Enberg and Jay Billis here at Cox Arena and uh, I arrived at 9.30, I live here in the San Diego area and they said hello and then they said get out of here. And they cleared uh, Cox Arena and most of us were waiting outside in the parking lot for some two hours before they made a complete sweep of Cox Arena. They found a suspicious container and they made absolutely certain all was well here. The fans waiting outside very patiently for a couple of hours. They didn't uh, come into the arena until about noon today. Then Alabama arrived and then the Marquette team, they were sitting on buses in the parking lot by their hotels, Jay, before they finally said, well, might as well go back to your room. Well, and, and taken out of their routine, they did have a chance to go back to their room and see some of the upsets that were going on in this NCAA tournament, but it's a, a situation they're just going to have to adapt to and overcome. It's happening for both teams. And uh, both teams seem very uh, steady with what has happened thus far. Uh, let's uh, talk about the star player for Alabama, a team that has a very short. In double overtime. 
As we take a look at the starting lineups here, first for Montana, they are the Big Sky champions, Criswell, Matthew Strait, Haskett, and DeLuey, and Nevada champions of the Western Athletic Conference, Fazekas, Charlo, Shiloh, Sessions, and Kemp. Now the two coaches have had a lot of success in a very short period of time. Larry Kristoviak, former NBA player, Montana standout in his second year with the Grizzlies, and Mark Fox took over for Trent Johnson when he took the Stanford job, and Fox, there has been very little drop-off from their Sweet 16 run of two years ago. The officials, Carl Hess, Leslie Jones, and Douglas Sermons. We are set, the number five seed against the number 12 seed in the Minneapolis bracket. Montana controls the tip with Virgil Matthews handling it. It's early in the day, but this is a bonus, isn't it? Getting a little extra basketball. Let's see if they can top the first game. Matthews couldn't handle that pass, kick out. Haskett really has come on of late, the freshman from Missoula, Montana. Here straight, what a season he's had. Jump up. Andrew Strait, first team, all big sky, comes in averaging just under 17 points per game. The sophomore from Yakima, Washington. And I haven't seen a jump hook from that far out since, I guess, Dave Cowens of the old Boston Celtic days. Good looking shot from Strait. <laughs> now Nevada, first possession. What a season they've had, 27 and five. Their highest ever seed in NCAA tournament play, a number five. Their sessions. Left hand, no. And rebound is scooped up by Strait. Well, some interesting matchups as we go along here with the man-to-man. -man. Montana really trying to keep their eye on Pasekas to keep him away from the glass with his easier touches down low. Pasekas, the All-American candidate, the junior from Arvada, Colorado. Here's Haskett putting it on the floor. A little bump out, I believe, along the baseline there with Johnson trailing just the touch. So the junior college transfer to Marche Johnson, the junior. He's got 10. And Lofton is more than just a three-point shooter. If you're going to play him to shoot the three, he is capable of making those runners in the lane, getting the ball to the basket. Bradshaw had the feed. Daniels had the catch. And a foul inside goes on Stanley Asumu. And one of the reasons that it's difficult to defend Lofton is he does such a great job moving with that ball. There's Martin, comes up to defend the three, and what does Lofton do? He fakes, he gets into the lane, makes a tough little jumper. You can't fault Terrell Martin on that last play. You've got to give a lot of credit to Lofton, however. Here's Otis Daniels at the free throw line. When Winthrop has hurt themselves here, you just saw their best free throw shooter, Schuler, miss the front end of a one and one, and now Daniels misses the first of a two shot opportunity. Watson the three. Daniels, the transfer from Gardner Webb. When Winthrop showing a little bit of pressure again. Oh! Good steal by Mark. Well, what is Wingate doing dribbling that ball? He's in that twice. Oh, Bradshaw puts it down. With a great follow. And Winthrop has come to within two. Locked in for three. Jarrell Mark palmed the ball. That's a Winthrop turnover. Seven of them. And Bruce Pearl is telling Wingate not to be dribbling that ball in the center of the court. And the reason he's telling him not to dribble the ball is precisely this. Terrell Martin just takes it away, and Schuler is able to go down, throw the ball up on the backboard. Bradshaw finishes. That's why you don't want your post guy dribbling the ball at half court. You got little guys to do that. <laughs> Walking with it, Martin defending. Dane Bradshaw. Lofton. Jump ball. They tie it up. Great defense by Craig Bradshaw of Winthrop. Defense there. The 15 seed. Trailing by two. The best rebound. 
rebounders in the Southeastern Conference, but rebounding going to be a big factor in this ballgame. Marquette really wants to go to the glass to keep Alabama and their big inside duo from getting second shots. That's an important factor for Marquette. Steal the G with eight seconds on the clock, and he's short on that attempt. So Alabama starts cold, and it has been one and out for Alabama thus far. Marquette Golden Eagles. There were the Warriors back when Al McGuire won the national title in 1977. When they made the move to that powerful conference, they'd have their troubles, but no one knew about the two freshmen that Crean was going to start who have been absolutely terrific. From the corner, and that's where he likes to shoot, John Felix. And the first points for Alabama come on the tray. For Alabama to be successful in this game, Sean Felix has got to hit perimeter shots to stretch that Marquette defense. Inside is the big man, Barrow, Usman Barrow, the 6'10 sophomore from Dakar, Senegal. Marquette so good off of ball screens, and Dominique James getting better and better at reading those situations. The game is starting to slow down for that freshman. Felix not afraid to fire, and there's one of those rebounds. So hard to get blockout responsibilities in a zone. You can't just turn. You've got to turn and box. And McNeil runs into a foul, scrambling for the rebound. Now three and a half minutes in, and Marquette with a one-point lead, Alabama with the ball. Mark Godfrey going with that crimson red coat. He started wearing that in response to Bruce Pearl at Tennessee, wearing that bright orange coat. <laughs> and he looked long and hard to find a, a coat of that color. Here's Felix. He hits another one. Same spot. And Alabama leads for the first time. A pair of trays from Joan Felix. That may wind up pulling Marquette out of that zone a little bit early. Thus far, Steve Novak, the leading scorer and a, one of the best three. With NCAA March Madness on demand, you can watch live tournament games on your computer outside of your viewing area for free. Sign up now at ncaasports.com slash MMOD. Tennessee is led by six. Winthrop is led by as many as three with 40.5 seconds to play in the first half. We talked about the way this game might play out, and so far it's sort of been what we talked about. Tennessee has been able to force some turnovers and make some transition opportunities, but Winthrop, 13 second chance points. They've done a great job on the board. Now Tennessee gonna trap a little bit out of the zone. Gainer, picked up by Lofton. And they match up again. Five second difference, game clock and shot clock. Bradshaw for the lead. Martin had it, stepped out of bounds. Well, he stepped out of bounds, and they're going to have to put some time back on the clock because nobody in here could hear that referee's whistle. Shot clock down to five. He gets the ball, goes out of bounds right there, and it appears there was about 7.8 seconds remaining. The clock did not turn off until 5.1. But the problem was it actually got loud in here in the Greensboro Coliseum. And the place is, uh, there's a lot of people in here for this game. And so they're going to look, I think we'll probably be about something uh, close to eight seconds, 7.7. 7. With a three-pointer, it's 27 to 18. Isn't he my uncle or something, she said? <laughs> Not today. <laughs> <laughs> That's a nice move by Collins off the back rim. Horford comes away with a rebound for Florida. It was a one-point game moments ago. Now an eight-nothing spurt for the Gators. Well, South Alabama just can't find a rim. Seven to twenty-five from the field and have no offensive flow whatsoever. And the foul spotted. It'll go. Jason McGriff picking it up. 
and, and Steven, I think they've had some decent looks. I mean, there have been some blocks, but, but some jump shots, they've, they've had some good looks, and they just haven't been able to knock them down. I think because of those early block shots, they've been rushing many of their shots in and around the basket. Well, and they've had difficulty swinging the basketball on the perimeter, looking for creases in the defense. It tends to stick in the guy's hands one or two passes, and they try to go off the bounce as opposed to passing the basketball and making the defense shift. Yeah, only three assists in this game so far. As you look at our game tracks, Alabama out to the early edge over Marquette, Larry Kristoviak's team leading uh, Nick Fasikas in Nevada. A very important factor in the outcome of the game. You know, they're going to get a couple more. That's 8.4, which is what they've put back up on the clock right now. And that's plenty of time for Tennessee to go down and get any sort of a look they want. Greg Marshall, I think, was hoping for 3.4. Greg Marshall signed a 10-year contract last season. A guy who had been pursued by other schools and says he likes it where he is right now. Even though it is not what you would consider a, a large conference or a large school. 8.4 and three seconds on the shot clock. Well, we looked at it and we thought that there was more than eight, and so we'll, we'll accept it. Schuler will inbound. Martin for the lead. Oh, I thought it was Tennessee's ball, though. <laughs> I thought that went off Schuler. And that is out of bounds. Tennessee's on top, 36 to 34, to New York and Greg Gumbel. All right, Kevin, thank you to Jacksonville, where Florida holds a 10-point lead on South Alabama. Coming up on two and a half minutes to play, let's go live to Veterans Memorial Arena. Tim Brando, Mike Jaminski, Stephen Bardo. 235 and counting here in Jacksonville, Florida. The Gators leading by nine. They just had an 8-0 spurt a moment ago. South Alabama doing everything they can to hang around. Brewer. That was an extending tip by Demetri Bennett to keep that ball alive for the rebound from McGriff. Well, the thing the Jaguars have to do, their two leading scorers have two points combined. They've got to get Law and Joyner going. That was a bad pass, and Horford and Brewer made them pay as well as Noah. And it's a timeout, South Alabama. 2.05 remaining. You talked about it, G-Man. Look at those picks running the floor. Light guards, and they lead by 11. From long range, and shoot it softly. Keep an eye on number 10 from Montana, who just checked in, a little Brian Ellis, junior college transfer out of Detroit, Michigan. He is a blur and loves to run. And a better job defensively there by Bell also against straight again. Out of travel. It's Kemp called for steps. Well, Nick Fazekas, he'll score in the post, he'll score on turnarounds, he'll score on fadeaways. One of four players in the nation averaging better than 20 points and 10 rebounds per game. And actually, one of the things about him, too, is he's not hunting down shots. He's actually being more of a quote-unquote role player for this team. You know, Mark Fox was mentioning that a little bit, too. He's saying he's not hunting things down, and in fact, he's scoring more because of it. Well, he said freshman year that Fazekas was overmatched physically. Fight for the loose ball inside. It's controlled by Bell for Nevada. Sophomore year, he got stronger, developed some new moves, and then Fox told us here in his junior year, he's just making people around him better. And that's the sign of a great player. Yep, when you have to recognize him, it opens it up for everybody else. We'll step aside, 11.47 to go. First half, Montana up seven. It's probably, a, it's, it's probably close to a miracle that they are this close without that. That's his first basket in the game with a minute 16 left. Yeah, he's got to break out in the second half. Really, Walter Hodge has done a wonderful job on him defensively, as has Torrey and Green. Now you see the difference they have when Adrian Moss comes onto the floor, much like Chris Richard, number four for Florida, can set those picks and allow Green to meander, finding open guys like Hodge. But Hodge had another open look from the corner who, where he was successful earlier. And right now, South Alabama's got to take advantage of this and close this gap towards halftime. Look at that. Between Joyner and Law, Mike, to echo your point, 
Uh, they average just under 25 a game, only four so far today. That three-pointer is drained by Bennett. Dimitri, who's um, been in 28 of 29 games, started them since transferring over from SMU. This is quite a collection of transfers and junior college players that have really been molded into a big-time winner in a short span of time by John Pelford. Right, and the thing, too, is they've got eight guys with over 50 three-point attempts, so there are a lot of people who can lift you up in the perimeter. At halftime, 31-25 our score. We'll send you to Greg Gumbel with singular in the half right after these messages. You're watching CBS Sports on our 25th road to the Final Four. And even as a guard, when you're playing zone, you have to turn and find somebody. You can't let one of the Crimson Tide players, especially an athletic player, just run in from the wing unobstructed. Alabama playing very clean offensive basketball, no turnovers. That's the credit of Ronald Steele, who makes his drive. Oh, how sweet that was, a light kiss off the glass. Well, that's the kind of drive, Dick, that drives a coaching staff crazy. Ronald Steele got all the way to the rim from the left wing. Nobody stepped in to take a charge. Nobody stepped in. He got all the way to the other side of the basket to complete that play. Biggest lead of this early game and another turnover. And Steve Novak, but for one shot, a three has been handcuffed by the Bama defense. CBS Sports presents Singular at the Half, sponsored by Singular. Raising the bar. Welcome back to our New York studio, Singular at the Half, and I'm Greg Gumbel along with Clark Kellogg and Seth Davis. Uh, Tennessee is leading the Winthrop Eagles by two at the break, 36-34. You were saying that this was just a great matchup for Winthrop, and so far, so good. Yeah, they've played a, an excellent first half because they've been able to attack when Tennessee is pressed, and they've also gotten some good scoring done inside, and their defense is very solid. They're one of the nation's best teams at taking the ball away from folks. Yeah, these teams have such similar styles. They both just look very comfortable out there. Winthrop certainly not in intimidated in the slightest, and C.J. Watson, the Tennessee point guard, has three fouls. That could be a problem. All right. Also at the break, South Alabama is trailing Florida by a score of 31-25. Very quickly here, South Alabama came roaring back. They sure game. did. Despite turnovers and poor shooting, they're only two possessions down right now. All right. Meanwhile, in San Diego, first game of the day underway there, and uh, Alabama leading Marquette 24-15. Let's go there live. Dick Enberg and Jay Billis. Here at the Cox Arena in San Diego State's campus, it's the number seven seed Marquette Golden Eagles and the 10 seed Alabama Crimson Tide and Bama out to a nine point lead early using the three point shot effectively and turnovers have hurt Marquette. And Marquette with five turnovers, eight Alabama points off those turnovers and Marquette now sticking with man to man trying to get a little more pressure on Alabama. Alabama's done a really nice job on the offensive glass. Getting second shot opportunities. Chris Grimm, number 33, 6'10", senior from Brighton, Michigan, who rarely plays, being used early by Tom Crean to try to stop uh, Jamar Jamario Davidson, who uh, has had it his way inside. Down to 10 on the shot clock. Alabama's had eight more field goal attempts early than Marquette. Oh my, Jean Felix has hit four trays here in the first half. Well, a mistake defensively by Joe Chapman. Late in a clock, Alabama likes to put the ball in the hands of Ronald Steele. When he drove, Chapman came off his man and left Felix wide open for a catch and shoot three point opportunity. Inside, Joe Chapman, they won't fall, and there's no back in to get the rebound. He said, you won't pass it to me. I'll, no, that isn't. It's Dan Alexander, just in the 6'8 sophomore from St. Paul, and he makes his presence filled early. Fitzgerald uh, averaging five points a game. Fitzgerald was a soccer player growing up. He's got great feet. Another offensive rebound, and G is fouled. John Felix needed to shoot the ball well for Alabama for the Crimson Tide to have a better chance to win. And he has come out firing first against the zone, knocking down his first three three-point opportunities. Then off the steel penetration, Chapman comes off to try to stop the drive. That left Felix wide open to get his feet set for a quick little catch and shoot. 
Fitzgerald with his first foul sends G to the line. He's a 50% shooter and misses his first. Big uh, Richard Hendricks, the 6'8", 265-pound freshman back in as uh, Davidson given a breather. Alonzo G, a very explosive player. He's averaging over 16 points per game his last four. Gets to the offensive glass. He has had some big ball games for Alabama this season and really brings a lot of energy onto the floor. Steve Novak on the bench for Marquette as Fitzgerald with the ball has replaced him. In the heavy traffic and McNeil throws it away. Steele with the steal. Pulls up for three. No. Another rebound. Hendricks. And they're going to call that a tie up and the arrow points to Marquette. CBS Sports Line will keep you close to the action. Fans get up to the minute scores and on demand highlights for each first round game at CBSSportsLine.com. And how about the early upsets? First scores in the first two that was the underdog with a victory today Wichita State and Wisconsin Milwaukee. That's funny, Wisconsin Milwaukee. Did the same thing last year, getting to the Sweet 16 under Bruce Pearl, and now Rob Jeter doing a terrific job. Great pass inside, sets up Usman Barrow, and he now has seven to lead Marquette. Marquette making better use of the dribble. They've had some drives where they've put themselves into trouble, over-penetrating. Steele with the penetration, and he draws the foul. So there's your score with uh, just about nine and a half minutes to play in the first half. The Crimson Tide leading Marquette 28-19. Meanwhile, in uh, Salt Lake City, Montana with a 23-18 lead on the Wolfpack of Nevada. In Greensboro, Tennessee, leading Winthrop 36-34. We'll get you there for the start of the second half in just a moment. CBS Sports presents Singular at the Half, sponsored by Singular, raising the bar. Lonzo G in there, and Evan Brock. There's another offensive rebound. Look at that, Hendricks power his way, and traveling is cold. And Hendricks is just a load down there in that second rebounding slot. Takes up a lot of space, and Mark Godfrey has done a terrific job with this team, keeping them in it, not just in this game, but all season long with all the injuries they've had to overcome. Wesley Matthews. On the side and the block and a foul. On the drive by Joe Chapman. G picks up his first foul. Joe Chapman is a senior from Chicago Heights. He and uh, Steve Novak, the only seniors in the top 10 players used by Tom Crane. Both of them played on that 2003 Marquette Final Four team that beat Kentucky to get to New Orleans and ultimately wound up losing to a very, very fine Kansas team in the Final Four. That was the Dwayne, Dwayne Wade team and Wade the uh, first to call his uh, former school and wish them well when he watched the selection show on CBS called Tom Crean and said uh, hit first that's my advice to you players hit first well they haven't today uh, they got the early lead but it's been uh, Alabama hitting not only uh, first but long to take the lead Wesley Matthews doing a nice job of getting out in passing lanes to force that catch a little bit further out on the floor G has it partially blocked, but Hendricks controls. Now Davidson, who's just returned, that's it. They play a little volleyball, and finally it's Dominique James the other way from Marquette. 